Hi, my name's Kristen Halbert, I'm a fellow Ujima member and a media and culture reviewer for the website Forces of Geek. And I'm on the Boston Comics and Color Festival Committee, Boston's only BIPOC focused uh, comic and arts festival. Hello, everybody. I'm Quincy J. For the room, for the room. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. I'm so used to talking to people. Oh, yes. Yes. My name is Quincy J. Roberts Sr., and I am currently the inaugural chair of NAACP LGBT Committee. It's something new, um, something fresh, and something bold. Um, I'm excited about that, but a little bit about me. My husband and I, Corey Yarbrough, started the Hispanic Black Gay Coalition in 2009, and before that, it was nothing for Black and brown people on the East Coast. Um, so a little bit about that. We've done spiritual growth. We've done coming out support. Uh, we've done youth conferences, and I'm proud to say that a lot of things that you see today in 2024 is because people saw us do it first. So I'm really, really proud of that, being a trendsetter. Um, and I've also worked for the city for over 12 years. I've worked for every mayor in most people's lifetime here in Boston. So I'm proud <laughs> about that. <laughs> Thank you, Quincy. And for those who don't know me, I'm Nia Evans. I use she, her pronouns. I'm with Boston Ujima Project. And I just want to thank Kristen for inviting Quincy to join us for this conversation. Um, so we'll just talk about what the format will be really quickly. First, we're gonna open up with a question to everybody here with us in person and on Zoom. We're gonna ask to hear from two or three people, uh, was there anything new or surprising that you learned about the moment that's being talked about, the time period that's being talked about in the clip that we just saw? So we'll just ask, to hear again from uh, two or three people. And then Kristen is gonna talk about some themes that she saw in this clip. Quincy will respond, a little bit of a conversation on themes. We'll look to hear from everyone else. And then we'll also, we'll end with, are there additional themes in this clip that we didn't talk about? All right, so I'm gonna check the chat and anybody in the room who wants to talk about anything that was new to them, Okay, we have somebody taking notes. Great. Um, please come up. This is the mic. The computer's the mic. Um, so if you want to talk about anything that was new uh, on Zoom or in the room, let us know. All right. Janice, come to the mic. We have someone in the room. Janice is coming. And uh, while Janice makes her way up here, Susan said, I had no idea that the march was pulled together so quickly. Mm, That's yeah. an excellent point. It's so monumental and mythical. It de definitely seems like it took a while. All right, Janice. Okay. Um, how many minutes do I have? <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, I'll I'll do a different thing. So historically, I was very young, and um, I think the word went out really quickly, and I had relatives in Washington D.C. Everybody was buzzing about this March. Of course, we didn't go. It was too young. We didn't go. Whatever. I mean, I had cousins living in D.C. and whatever. And also, my roommate, C.C.H. Pounder, was in this. We went to... We went to started her roommate? For one weekend, we went to the <laughs> Black Writers Conference at Howard. Uh, my professor sent two people, and we went. So I didn't know she was in, in the movie. For those who may not know, CC H. Pounder was playing Dr. Hedgeman in and Hedgeman in the movie. And I didn't know much about her, but I'll have to learn more about her. But um I didn't know about the headquarters where it was located. So I'll have to do a search and find out um where it is. Um I knew there was there's been opposition to the march, but it's something that happened real quickly because people were dedicated and wanted it to happen. I don't know if anything like that would happen today because people have their brains and they talk about things and they think about them too much and things like that happened. So um, what else do we need to know? Also during the, um, I don't know if the other part gets to it, what happened, um, Dr. Du Bois passed in Ghana right before the march. And uh, marches in Washington are very hot in the summer. I've been to a few of them. I also, I went to, I think, I know, one of them was uh, before King's birthday became a holiday. Lived on these buses mm -hmm. in the snow, came in snow in Boston, many inches, and we went to that. 
Um, eventually, fast forward into my career, I ended up at uh, Teachers College in New York City, and I got to meet him. And um, I met him because in those days, he was a typewriter. So I met his nephew somewhere. And he said, can I borrow your typewriter? He did. And he said, oh, my rest is my uncle. He went to meet him. I said, sure, why not? And I did. He was living the top floor somewhere. And we chit-chatted for a while. And that was it. But since the movie came out, um, I would like to find out if he's still alive so I can say hello to him. But um, it was nice to show the opposition, the coordination, and different things. Interesting, I'll give another side thing. Strong Thurman was um, a staunch, staunch segregationist, but what he said is um, he had to follow the law in South Carolina. That's why he was so strong that way. And the rumor was that my grandfather knew him because they were all in South Carolina and segregated and things like that. And other things happened. And what other can I think about? But I'm glad they showed, you know, the King family in different setting and different people. Everybody who got there, all the students. There's not a lot of people talk about that. We talk about um, people in the movement, but sometimes we don't talk about the people who actually did the organizing for him and did the work for him. So um, that's excellent. That's it. Thank right you. Now. Yeah. So, okay. <laughs> Um, I'm going to note something that happened inside the chat. Do we have a comment? I didn't realize that there was such tension with the NAACP. Mm. Uh, does that resonate with anybody in the room or online? Mm. No, no, no. That's good. That's good. That's a good question. Yes. Some good observation. Going to note our NAACP representative. Absolutely. <laughs> right here. But, um, Spencer, did you learn anything that you felt was new? So, absolutely. When I first saw this, I saw the screening. Um, I got a chance to see the screening at a Netflix screening in L.A. Um, or at a friend's house in L.A., I should say. Um, and then we had a formal screening in L.A. And then we had another screening here in Boston where a lot of different organizations came to see it. Um, and for me, before I even joined uh, NAACP, um, just like a lot of people, I didn't think they did much um, and for my life. I'm only 42 years young, um, but I've never really seen the NAACP do anything um, but boycott movies and boycott people. Um, so fast forward to now being in politics, um, it was surprising to see how uh, homophobic, because um, mm -hmm. that's what it was. Um, it was fear. Um the chairman at the time had a lot of fear of the unknown. I think most of the men at that table, I can't speak for them, but just seeing the movie and just getting a sense of how I navigate the world. I know a lot of people are cool with me until I say my husband or I say um, I'm gay or anything LGBT or pronouns. When I go out the norm, that's when I start to get what uh, Brother Rustin got. So it was very shocking to see that uh, it's still happening, um, and it started back in the '60s, probably longer than that. Mm -hmm. Did you find anything new you learned in this little in section? this in this little clip? Um, I appreciate the person who talked about the the speed. I didn't think about that the first time mm -hmm. I saw it, but yeah, um, when I think about it, I, I think about how much for me at least it's a given that there's probably a certain amount of time um, for something that big. And we know from the first clip, that was the largest at the time. There have been larger since, but that was the largest at the time. And so you do think, yeah, takes a little bit of time, but it was two months. Mm. Um, so I, I appreciate Susan bringing that up. Thank you. So as um, you might know, if you were here last week, we also talked a little bit about themes, both themes that we have throughout the entire movie, as well as themes that we have that we're seeing like just in this space. Uh, and a couple, <laughs> maybe Quincy already has a couple <laughs> in his mind, it seems like. Um, but some that I had already seen when I was looking through this, especially was uh, that intersection of personal relationships and activism and how much as a leader that you really have to show to the people that you're leading and the people that you're working with in order to be authentic and 
Quincy, you already had a lot of experiences of what happens when you reach a certain level of authenticity mm. and the room changes. Could you share a little bit more about that? Yeah, um, I don't want to discourage anybody in the room or on the uh, uh, Zoom, but uh, authenticity will get you in trouble, uh, especially in 2024. It's hard to enter a room and say, I'm Black, I'm gay, I'm from the South. Um, my R's, you may not hear them sometimes, um, but I got two degrees. So um, it's one of those things that uh, we constantly have to um, try to show up as our authentic selves as much as possible without making other people feel uncomfortable. Um, it's unfortunate. Um, but yeah, that's one of those things that just uh, we got to work on, I guess, and just have more uh, difficult conversations around sexuality. Um, because one thing I notice um, with anybody, um, when you talk about LGBT issues, people automatically go into your bedroom. I don't know why they do that, um, because anybody who identifies as queer, I know when we meet a heterosexual person or a straight person, I don't think about what you're doing with your partner. Um, so I don't ask were you straight or not. So I think it's unfair for LGBT folks, especially LGBT activists in movements that are not queer movements. We are always questioned in our bedroom, so. Anyone in the room wanna weigh in on this? I know, I know what he said, but also, you know, you can be authentic in this space. Yes, uh, absolutely. <laughs> no, I encourage authenticity. In this space, um, safety. But, you know, in our nine to fives, it can get us in trouble. Um, and sometimes in other areas, people don't like assertive people. They don't like people who are passionate about something. And Brother Rustin was very passionate about it. He knew that um, he had issues, um, and I, I say the issues with um, coming to terms with his sexuality, uh, being in a space where there are not many out queer people. So, and I'm sure we'll get to that on how these relationships uh, intertwine. So I'll stop there. Well, actually, well, I'm going to build more on what you said about people changing when you are more authentic mm -hmm. and share a bit more about each other. Because um, we could see that the respectability politic, mm. which is also not even a theme just in this section, but we're seeing is definitely a theme throughout the entire movie, mm -hmm. uh, very strong at the time, but we are still grappling with that right now. I'm not sure if there's anyone online or anyone in the room who felt like they have ever been uh, taken away or taken down from a movement because of the respectability politic of it all. I see some nodding heads inside the room. You can just have, you know, hands or in the chat if you're online. Um, but actually, Neil, let's bounce to you about how respectability politic has maybe affected your work in movements. It hasn't. <laughs> but <laughs> um, let me circle back to that. Because okay. I probably just don't remember at this stage maybe you're just like blocked it out fugue state just i might have blocked it out mm, yeah but <laughs> yeah but i'm thinking about the um personal relationships bit and kind of the mix of uh personal relationships um and leadership and participation um and I think in addition to so yes definitely respectability politics I mean there's a one which that's always that's that's always there, um, and then this this um, bit about when authenticity is too much. I'm also thinking about um, I want to say ex expectations mm -hmm. um, in terms of both authenticity mm -hmm. and uh, respectability politics. So I think I'm I'm thinking of how. We, and we talked about this a little bit last time in which there are ways in which um, I think Bayard and, and Martin are kind of similar. So thinking about how it seems like they kind of navigate with that at the same time. Um, so navigating, um, having to meet a certain level of authenticity because you got to reach mm -hmm. people. Um, and also particularly Martin, their respective positions. Mm -hmm. And then I think there's there's expectations on that side. Um, I think that's what I'm thinking about in terms of the the personal relationships bit. It's demanding mm -hmm. for sure, 
Um, the other thing that I that I think is interesting about that about this clip that we saw when they show the family life, uh, the family life is actually peaceful and beautiful, and I don't know that you get a sense of actually how demanding a life that must have been. And so I think it's interesting that we don't see that. And maybe I'm assuming it's more demanding than it actually was. Or maybe it was important to the filmmaker to show that. Lots of different creative choices. Yeah, here. definitely want to echo the uh, <laughs> importance of family because that's the first theme I wrote down on my notebook. I'm a former teacher, so I'm always jotting down notes. <laughs> um, and lifelong educator and student, as we say. But no, the theme of family and brotherhood was very prominent in this clip that we showed. Um, and I'm very excited that the... Um, director and the people behind the film showed this because uh, it made Byron uh, Byer, um feel very human. Um, he had a sense of belonging. If you do any research, you know, he was, he lived a long life, a long, full, healthy life, um, but he was always longing for that family. Um, and I think he saw that family in Coretta. We all know, uh, well, most of us know in the queer movement that Coretta was bigger, a bigger cheerleader for LGBT rights than anything else in her entire life. That's a fact. Google it. Um, so that scene um, kind of made me tear up the first time I've seen it over and over. So I'm, I'm my emotions are in check today. Um, but the first time I, see, I saw it, I got really emotional because that they didn't have to put that in there. They didn't have to show that at all. So kudos and shout out to Netflix, the Bahamas and all the other people <laughs> around that's responsible for this. Can I say one more thing? Please. The other, the other thought, and I was trying to I was trying to catch it before. The other thought that I was having with regards to the personal relationships bit is um there's some messiness, mm. which is very real because people are not perfect. People are flawed beings. And I think there's a way in which we, I mean, we know this. We definitely will romanticize mm -hmm. um the past period. Um, and we'll definitely romanticize. Um, are the people that we look up to, that we admire. And so just thinking about the bit with um, Tom, you know, Tom does not like seeing Elias around so much. Um, and Tom has to make decisions because uh, he's part of this movement. He has work to do. He has to squelch his sense of possessiveness and jealousy, perhaps, and being hurt. Um, he expresses it. And he does the press releases. Mm -hmm. So I think it's also um Sound like it's a not campaign. right. Yeah. And it's not <laughs> we're not being beat over the head with it, but these are just at a on a certain level, just regular human beings with the same kind of frailties and flaws that we all have. I do want to ask in the room and online. Um, if you have any feelings about when a lead, when a leader is messy, when they are human <laughs> and like how that literally when they're human, like how does that affect like how you are engaging with the movement? <laughs> yeah. Like when a leader is messy, when a leader is human, how does it affect your engagement <laughs> with the, the movement? Okay. <laughs> Woo. In the room. Come to the mic. Come to the mic. Yeah. We're going to be inclusive of our online brother. Right. And sister. Um, I think that's sort of the other double-edged sword of authenticity, which is mm -hmm. actually we do need to show mm -hmm. when we're messy and what failure looks like and what Absolutely. like getting back up after failure looks like and like modeling conflict and, and a good approaches to conflict. But like, I think the other side of that is then you get critiqued mm -hmm. and people try to take you down or um you know we saw examples of like you know undermining leadership um based on like perceived even perceived flaws and not not even real flaws um and i think we like we have a culture now i feel that is much more ready to uh, to attack people and not allow for that sense of failure i think because we're so afraid and we're so committed to these goals mm -hmm. We don't allow people the authenticity to be messy, but we need the messiness because we need to learn from that because um, we know inherently we are. What's your name? Simona. 
Thank you, Zerona. That was gorgeous. Yeah, I, I just want to um, add on to that. It's a part in the scene we saw where um, Brother Rustin and Martin were uh, talking about uh, the next step after he had fired him, because I believe he fired him twice in his um, in their whole uh, friendship, um, both for the same, pretty much for the same reasons, only because he was uh, LGBT and people were threatening, blah, 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 to uh, come out with the DL story. Mm -hmm. um, and I think in this scene that we saw, that was, he didn't say it, but that was uh, Brother uh, Martin's way of just saying, I'm, I'm sorry. So that's where I put the the brotherhood part of the team. So yeah, I'll just want to quickly add to that question. For the room too. Oh yeah, for the room. <laughs> I feel like uh, leadership is also like like acknowledging your messiness mm. and like seeing it and like moving through it. And I think for me, like it's important for leaders just to to know they're messy and mm -hmm. to like to like. You know, I feel like if they are un incapable of seeing that and seeing how disruptive it is, I think that is usually a, tell a telling sign that, like, this is not the type of leader that I want to stand behind. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think, do think there's, like, a you need to be conscious of it um, and understand it, and acknowledge it as a, the first step in moving forward and not just sort of moving it or ignoring it, you know? I just want to add that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Absolute James. value add, James. Um, any other comments on this particular part? And, yeah, oh. There. Oh, I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> I know what. <laughs> um, so I do violence prevention work on a, a college campus, and it's interesting to think about like kind of messiness in leadership because. One of the concepts that we try to teach um, our students and even like kind of practice within our office is that um, there's not like this black and white area when we talk about like people who can cause harm and people who can experience harm. Like if you have experienced harm, you're capable of causing harm. And I find it to be really helpful in try trying to like get our message across to the community by not saying like, oh, this group is bad, this uh, group is good. And I think the same thing needs to happen like when people step into like roles of leadership is to like kind of put that out there and say like, I'm not always gonna be good and you're not always gonna like me. You're not gonna like my decisions. You're not gonna like what I do. And I think that gives more space for leaders to be messy if um, you actually lay that foundation first. Um, and I think that's maybe what I hope for with like, quote unquote messy leaders is that like they like put that out there so I don't like kind of readily put them on a pedestal love it. thank you I'm Ashley <laughs> thanks Ashley uh, Mary do you want to um say aloud what yours is? oh what something like what yes I mean Mary put it in the chat so that's <laughs> oh, right oh. I know <laughs> I, I feel like Messiness is super cool. I'm a messy person, which is why. But I think there's a difference between like messiness and harming people. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's where like the line needs to be drawn because I think that if you are like engaging in the act of harming people, uh, people don't feel really like safe. And I would like safe versus like comfortable. It's okay to not to be comfortable around people, but to feel unsafe. I think that's where it's like, I don't know if you should be in a position of leadership. Yes. Uh, but yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Mary. Thank you for that distinction. Also for giving me my warning that I had two minutes left because it's 7.13. <laughs> I lost track of time because this has been just like a really excellent discussion with all of you guys. Um, and so I just want to say thank you. All right. Actually, unless we have like maybe four more minutes because there was one more question I wanted to okay. maybe ask. Oh, yeah. You. So I was, I was just... Do you think you can say the weekly questions from the breakout room for Okay. Yes. Okay. Because right. uh, the last thing that I really wanted to ask, again, online and everybody in the room, was about um, our one of our last scenes with all of the leaders, with our youth organizers who were not allowed to even be at the table, mm -hmm. completely represented by Rustin, and the fact that he had to move the march from two days to one day. 
which was a loss to the students, which was a victory to some people at that table, which was a compromise to other people at that table. And my real question is for the room for online, but I'm gonna start with Quincy. Uh, what is actually necessary for something to be a compromise mm -hmm. rather than a loss? Uh, that's the story of probably everyone's life is compromise, uh, whether it's through marriage, friendship, uh, parenthood, it's a life is a compromise. And uh, when I see things like that, um, I always tell people that I mentor shoot for the stars and hopefully we'll get something. Um, so yeah, if you're looking for shopping for a car and you might find a used car, it's just as good as the new one. At least you got a car and you're driving it. Um, however, don't give up. Don't give up on that um, bottom line. Keep going, keep asking um, and demand that you have a seat at the table. And those look that looks many different ways to have a seat at the table. That's in the ballot box, um, that's in protests, that's in social media now. We have a great tool of um, social media. So just using your voice um, to advocate your seat at the table. And once you get that seat at the table, bring people that don't look like you or look like you that won't get invited to the party uh, for the photo ops. Bring those people to the table and watch how things slowly but surely change. So life is a compromise, folks. It's just what we have to do to get things done. If I had to print a mug right now, <laughs> uh, anyone online or in the room that has a feeling about what needs to be on either side for something to be a solution when you do have like two opposing forces coming together. I see people ruminating. Mm -hmm. Because yes. I, I know someone in the room has worked with someone that they <laughs> have to give some compromise. So it's something to think about. I don't have an answer to the mm -hmm. question. I think it's an excellent question. Okay. But what I will you say, what do you say? To amusing? I do. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> so I think what I will say is it's an excellent question. And I think one thing to be aware of in trying to answer the question in a specific situation is to resist the inclination to rationalize after the fact. Mm. Um, so sometimes it's a loss and I don't know what that looks like in a particular situation. And I think it is important to be able to say, we lost, we failed. Cause I could also see where there could be the inclination to say, well, it was a compromise. It wasn't that bad. Mm. And sometimes it's bad. So, you know, I think just in terms of proper assessment mm -hmm. and figuring out a way forward, yeah, it's it important it? to resist that inclination. Is it worth the compromise? Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Did anyone want to share any last closing thoughts that were just really burning on their mind? I love how everyone's looking left to right as if the person on your left or right rather than you <laughs> oh, has a feel. Oh, there we go. Oh, oh. <laughs> Thank you, Tanya. Hi, everyone. Good evening. I'm Tanya. My... Mm -hmm. Okay. Hi, my name is Tanya, and I'm having um, some questions, though, that about not questions, but I'm impressed with how much of a leader he must have been to be able to have police officers remove their revolvers. That was incredible to me, mm -hmm. to have them not only remove their revolvers, but to go down to D.C. Mm -hmm. and be among people to be a, a force of peace. That is incredible to me, to have that kind of influence, because I don't know any police officer that would do that. But <laughs> so that was my observation. I love that observation. That was a very powerful scene. It truly was. Logistics for the next one? Yes. Okay. All right. <laughs> cool. So I think we are wrapping up our conversation. Thank you once again, Kristen. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Quincy. Quincy, did you want to make an announcement about anything? Um, well, we have a lot of things going on. Um, <laughs> if you all want to come to um Estella. Uh, bar and grill, um, well, bar and lounge, I'm sorry, no grill, um, <laughs> bar and lounge. Um, we, we're going to have a little get together right after this. Oh, uh, well, not right after this, but like 20 or 30 minutes after this, you're more than welcome, uh, to join us. No pressure. Um, and then, uh, last but not least, uh, NAACP, I, I did want to say this in the beginning, we are changing. We're not perfect. Um, 
We're going to hold ourselves accountable. We're going to have these difficult conversations. If you read the banner, the article in the banner, if you haven't, go read it. Um, and it, I explain exactly what we're doing, starting with conversations like this. Um, but what I challenge everybody to do when we have these conversations, NAACP, Urban League, um, whoever the uh, organization is, bring somebody that disagrees with you because that's where the movement happens. Um, we can get in the room and we can pat each other on the back. We can agree with each other, but your neighbor that does not like you or has issues with you, that's where the real change has. And that's where the compromise that we just talked about um, actually comes into action. So thank you all for having me. Um, please uh, sign up for NAACP to be a member. We're going to be doing some amazing things. Um, I say that because I mean it and I'm very passionate about everything I'm a part of. I would not be a part of it if we weren't going to do big things. Thank you. Thank you, Quincy. Thank, thank you, Quincy. We'll hold you to all of this. Hold yeah. to it. Yes, we First will. Oh, and shout out Malcolm X. Uh, this is the day Malcolm X died. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So shout out to Malcolm X. He was very similar to Brother Rustin. They debated. So Google that one too. All right. Thank you all. So um, as with the first two sessions, we'll just start with, was there anything new for anybody in this clip? Anything new or anything surprising? I'd like to say something. Come to the mic. Come to the mic. Hi, everybody. Gio, he, him, pronouns uh, here with Ujima staff. Uh, something that stood out to me significantly was I like the way that um, he spoke to the police, the well, the law enforcement person that was mm -hmm. like, oh, we got the whole D.C., we got the troops, we got this and that. And it kind of reminded me a little bit about the National Guard being activated here in um, 2020 against regular people um but back to the film i like that he wasn't intimidated um even though like that guy was listing off every you know level of law enforcement that you don't want to encounter as a person talking about civil rights so um i appreciated his like boldness um yeah, yeah. thank you thank you thank you geo Okay, so now we'll turn it over to Christy. You want to uh, yeah. introduce just, yourself for people sure who don't know quick, you? I just want to make sure real quick, anybody online that learned something new inside of this, I know that about a quarter of this particular clip was the march and everyone really was <laughs> a lot about the march. But any of the information beforehand or maybe right after, just want to give a little five second space for that. Thank you, Susan. I have a teaching license, so I am fine with a pregnant pause. Thank you. All right. Um, I I hadn't I didn't know about the part where he they actually came to his defense, and that was pretty um, emotional. Um, I mean, he was emotional, but I was also emotional. That was pretty amazing, and then just the whole to see again that. But all those people there for the march is pretty inspiring. So, but yeah, I didn't, I was unaware of, I knew there was controversy. I didn't realize that, that he had been. Finally seen. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Anyone else would we go into some other themes that we might have seen today? I just wanted to um, lift up what Susan said. Um, I completely agree. Um, and I think it was also equally really powerful for me um, to see the solidarity between uh, Martin Luther King Jr. and uh, Bayard Rustin, um, you know, at a time like that, you know, um, he had put in all this work over like two months to pull this or to support um, and strategize the pulling of this together, the organizing of this monumental event. Um, and so to see him in the time since be written out of history, um, you know, knowing that, holding that, and then also realizing that at the time people did come to his defense um, is really powerful. <laughs> Paula, do you want to add? Uh, am I, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. All right. I really appreciate it. I missed the beginning. It took me a while to find the link to get in. But um, but uh, I really appreciated the scenes that I saw, especially with his saying, you know, there's nothing um, um, 
unworthy about picking up the trash and so forth in that scene. And it really shows how sort of the arc of his um, his level of commitment and, you know, and his attention to everything, all of this work was essential at whatever level. And so um, I thought it was a really, you know, beyond the, the, the response in terms of people that were acknowledging his full humanity. Clearly there was stress about his not being able to st still be out it from other people and the threats and all of that. Um, but the, the visual way the, the movie showed his presence and I thought it was particularly moving to see his, his, his commitment expressed the way he did it at the very end. So that just gave more about his character and makes me, draws me in to really wanting to know more about the story. I'd want to see the movie. So I'm really glad to have the opportunity to hear this kind of conversation and be here for this. And I'll go see the whole thing again or find it on a screen or something. But, but thank you all. Yeah. Thank you, Paula. You actually hit upon one of our themes for like in literally two minutes. Oh, oh. okay. <laughs> no, great job <laughs> on track. Uh, uh, Nia did remind me to introduce myself. Hi, I'm Kristen Halbert. In addition to being a fellow Ujima member, I am also a community organizer here in Boston, but also a media and cultural reviewer that specializes in BIPOC and women-led films. Um, super excited to be here and to talk about a little bit of the themes and things that we've seen come up. And one of them actually is servant leadership, mm. which is really seen in this uh, last third, but certainly has been a theme that we've looked at for the entire movie. Uh, Nia, I really believe that when he was a when he said that thing about the trash collector but mm -hmm. also when those uh, students were talking about the only reason that they could do that work 12 to 15 hours a day was because they had him as this guiding star as the servant leader mm -hmm. who felt like they were in the trenches with him mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but how did you see that exemplified in yeah i appreciate that kristen and also just to get you ready sierra we're going to ask you to respond as well to this question so i so what this makes me think of, Kristen, is not just servant leadership, um, but then the umbrella of that there are multiple types of leadership and different ways to be a leader. I think that that is um, what your, your um, comment about servant leadership, I think that that's one of the reflections it raises. And so when you talk about both um, how buyer, um talked about and showed about what leadership meant to him. Um, also, when you bring in um, the um, the kind of inspiration that he was for younger people, um, I think also a part of that was not just his guidance, but also the work he did. And we saw this, I think, in the first clip um, to kind of uncover their own leadership. And so it also just makes me think about, again, servant leadership and also just all the different ways that leadership can look. And to your point, um, even beyond by it, we're seeing this, right? So we're, we we see all the different types of leaders. Um, we see um, the different ways actually that that, that that leadership looks. And then we do see that at least, with, at least amongst this crowd, um, Bayard's style of leadership is different, yeah. Sierra, love to have your additions to that. And also, I think everyone here does know you, but tiny little introduction, please. Yes. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. My name is Sierra Peters. I'm the uh, Director of Communications, Culture, and Franchisement here at Ujima. Um, Kristen, can you restate the question for me? Oh, certainly. <laughs> really, it's more about, we see that he was a servant leader, but like, what do you see in servant leadership? Like, what did, did that look like to you through the movie or in life that you see right now? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, Nia, were you going to say something? No, I'm listening to you. Sorry, I thought that I heard it. <laughs> yeah, one thing that came up for me was definitely, I think, Nia, what you mentioned a little bit earlier. Um, you know, I, I constantly have to place myself um in in where he is um when I'm watching this and so I'm like I have to remember that they pulled this together in a very short amount of time um with uh you know they had the resources of the NAACP and you know all these other groups eventually 
Um, but you know, it it was it was a monumental um endeavor with no cell phones, no internet, no email, no fax, <laughs> right? Like, and so like yeah, you know, yeah. The, the, what were the tools that they had and so like I'm I'm trying to reground myself in, in that context and in that moment and I think you know to Nia's point the humble attitude that he had as he's watching the men of the movement um walk away from him and when the moment that he chooses to like stay with the people um mm -hmm. you know to be in service and and you know to uh yeah no I just keep coming back to this word humble um because he doesn't, you know, he because of the because of the fact he was a, a student organizer, I think I might be misstating this, but because of the fact that he was a socialist at one point, because of the fact that he might not have had the right pedigree, background, sexual orientation, whatever, he's not mm -hmm. allowed to rise to the ranks mm -hmm. of the other men. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, I'm, I'm just I'm I'm in awe, honestly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know of of that ability to remain with the work stay grounded in the work to continue doing the work um when you know that there is a ceiling for you and when you know that the work has to be done anyway mm -hmm. can, I, can mm -hmm. I respond to what Sierra just said really quick yeah. so I really appreciate this the the reflection on um the the last scene um and just adding to that I think maybe just saying this a different way, Sierra, because it, it just really is striking me as you say it. Um, also appreciating um, he didn't see that as a loss because I, yeah. I could see how perhaps <laughs> in a different kind of narrative, true or fictionalized, we could, I think, kind of easily see an alternate ending where it's like, oh, he was robbed of something because the ultimate prize would have been being uh allowed in a in a particular room in a particular sort of way and i and i think what we saw was not that's not necessarily the case i wasn't necessarily a loss so you said he chose to stay with the people and that was um that was um i, I don't want to just say just opposite of a loss but just to say that that was not a loss it was not a diminishment of him mm -hmm. um as a person it was not a reduced uh, position. It was just a different place. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate that. Um, before I put Sierra completely on the spot about other themes that they saw, uh, does anyone else have anything that they might want to add about that concept of leadership in this? Yep, go ahead. I think you're in. One other quick question, I guess, is is it okay okay um mm -hmm. i'm really i mean since i'm of the generation of that of that march i'm really in and so in this age in this time I, and this doesn't have to be answered ex right in this particular moment but in general how is it that that those qual that that type of character that he exhibited especially at the end how how can that be recognized and expressed current in the current day with the current generations that are really on the forefront, how how is that that disposition that those values recognized through screens and all of the different ways that our our communication is mediated? So that's my question, and I'm really hungry for that. So, thanks. That's a really good question. I'm a facilitator, so I'm going to actually send it to my two young people. Yeah. <laughs> and Chris was reading my mind because I was like, I think I think I want to hear what Sierra has to say. Right. <laughs> well, we gave Sierra prep time like Batman. So please. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what is, you know, it, it is, I I think, oh God, what is like <laughs> I'm feeling into this question because it's a hard one, right? Um, and so I'm gonna restate it so I can make sure that I understand what you're trying to ask. Um, so are you asking like um, if we look at Rustin as a model, um, perhaps like what are the qualities, textures, um, what is like the embodied feeling of a grounded principle around not necessarily needing to be at the forefront or is it something else? Oh. 
Paula's trying to unmute. We're just we're there. Yeah. Right so, um, uh, it, it was it was a broader question about because there was more. Like I said, I caught more the tail end, but the the values that all of uh, that are being lifted up right now in terms of his beliefs, his his the norms, his behaviors, the way he walked in the world. How would that be recognized mm. in all its different manifestations in contemporary times? Mm -hmm. with the way communication is mediated digitally, mm -hmm. I think is, is one thing that comes to my mind. Um, mm -hmm. So how is that recognized, appreciated and valued as it's transmitted across various screens and various technologies today? You know, mm -hmm. how do you, I mean, we've got, you know, TikTok, we've got all these other things going on that shape culture, right. shape mm -hmm values and beliefs mm -hmm. so how does that how do the values that you saw exhibited there can they be recognized and appreciated today mm -hmm. right i mean i think y'all that are like going to be carrying these torches and doing the work now so yeah yeah i mean i think yeah. i think it's definitely a different time right um <laughs> it, this is this is definitely a different time but i think he might not have found as much opposition mm. uh to I'm trying to choose my words carefully because I did have a kernel about celebrity and uses of celebrity that I, I was like kind of thinking about um, mm -hmm. as, we were, mm -hmm. as we were watching this. Um, but I do think that he he would not have found it as difficult now to um, occupy the same positionality or the same position as some of the other men. Um, I think that he definitely would have been more accepted in the movement now um mm -hmm. I don't know how you know I I can't speak I can only speak to the spaces I've been in where queerness is like fully accepted um and perhaps those are right. self right. places, you know where, where gayness and queerness are accepted and right yeah <laughs> right. so I, I do think that he might have had an easier time um mm -hmm. now than he did back then right like we're not necessarily mm -hmm. we're con you know it's not a, a McCarthyism of that time and so you know communism is not as much of a dirty word now as it was then um you know uh queerness is not as uh uh well let me not say that but <laughs> i do think that in the, in the time <laughs> that we find ourselves in now where you know celebrity um is so prevalent i mean you know if he was the person that they wrote him as he could read you know like he was he was getting people together. And so I think, you know, mm -hmm. he might have found his place. He might have been ahead of his time in that regard. Mm -hmm. But I don't yeah. know. I'm curious yeah. about what Kirsten, um, Nia, and maybe anybody else <laughs> in the room. Yeah, I do. I appreciate that. And I appreciate you um, working to reframe the question, Sierra, and then Paula, you um, um, providing some clarity. Because I, I, I think I do have a couple of reflections on your question. And I actually was also thinking about this earlier and just didn't say it. But um, I would say today, and there's a there's a teammate of ours, um, Ray, um, who kind of uses this term a lot. But I would say there's a there's a paradigm of um, leaderfulness today that I would say is a um, I I'm I I would say it's a paradigm that from my from my experience from my understanding. Um, it's one that the Black Lives Matter movement has really um, amplified because it's not okay. new. It's mm -hmm. not new, but I think has definitely um, it it has it has come to I think more attention and embrace. And I think this connects to probably maybe some maybe the kind of um, what you're alluding to with regards to this kind of notion of celebrity, Sierra, because I. I do think it is a bit of a um it's a bit of a reaction and it's a bit of a um interruption of this notion that there is one type of leader um and it is this kind of like singular charismatic figure <laughs> um yeah. is perfect and amazing in all the ways mm -hmm. and everyone everyone should listen to them um yeah. as Supposed to and 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 I do think this directly connects when you say, well, what are the what are the values that we saw Bayard exemplify? And so we talk about, for example, um, 
uh, uh, his ability to both inspire as well as draw out uh, the leadership capabilities right. of the younger people that he was working with. Right. So then I think this- Eager this, to do that, uh, yeah. Exactly. And so I think the frame, the paradigm of leaderfulness um, mm -hmm. is one that similarly mm -hmm. said, <laughs> it looks different. It can look a whole bunch of different mm -hmm. ways. And we all have uh, leadership ability in some way, taper, mm -hmm. in some way, shape, or form. And it comes from mm -hmm. a bunch of different places. And so then mm -hmm. rather think that there's there's one type of leadership that we should either be looking for or following, we can recognize uh, there are so many different types of leadership actually that are around us already, including ourselves, right, right. including what's inside right. us. And I think that that mm -hmm. is one way that we're mm -hmm. seeing it today. And so then all the tools that you've mentioned uh, and the mechanisms that you've mentioned, um, it, it then really, I think, provides avenues and channels for all of the different ways that we can contribute. And really then leadership really is just about, it's about your contribution, it's about your participation. Um, and I would say it's kind of about your um, sincerity for lack of a better word. But now we have channels that allow you to do that in so many different ways. Maybe you can't march, but you can speak on TikTok. You know, you can speak on, on social media or you can, you know, record a record a video. So I think that the uh, newer kind of uh, media environment is really just one of just more tools. I think that allow us all to express ourselves um, and our leadership more fully. I think that's how it shows up. I mean, And I did want to check both in the room and online if anyone also wanted to answer this question or address this question. Okay, I'll look around the room. Thank you. Thank you, Janelle. <laughs> um, when I think about this question, and really you guys just answered it so beautifully, the only thing I might add is at the end of yours when you said um, uh, it wasn't, I'm thinking authenticity, what you mm, had said. Sincerity. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I think that currently we are in a point that we are really craving, desperately craving authenticity. Um, and part of it is that reflection of there are just so many ways to show so many parts of yourself, but also that means there are so many ways to hide, obfuscate, mm. and <laughs> show a different side that may not be as real about yourself. And even when we are getting the authentic person, like we're still struggling with accepting someone authentically that isn't perfection. We still want someone who's authentically perfect, which is literally impossible. <laughs> so I think even in this day and age, like we're still struggling with a lot of the issues that we saw inside of this movie. I can't remember exactly what the line was, but there was a lot of signifying inside of the room. I think it was when he was talking with Martin about like, this is who I am and this is how mm. I'm showing up and I'm not defending. Why do I have to keep defending myself if I'm doing this work and I'm showing this, showing up and I'm leading. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you do have to wonder if that actually, um, came through to Martin, he went back to talk to them about how they needed to show up for by the way that he was showing up for everybody else. Mm -hmm. And if anything, maybe he was that impact on them in order for them to actually be honest about how important he was to them and how important he was to the movement. And finding that authenticity and finding that acknowledgement of these values today can be pretty difficult. Mm -hmm again I'm gonna leave space for the end thank you <laughs> thank you Paula thank you for the question um but Sierra I didn't get to hear your ex uh, additional theme yeah I mean my additional theme um and this is always my additional theme uh is the uses of celebrity and movement building I think one thing that we saw uh uh, you know, they, they showed a glimpse of it, but I don't think, um, you know, maybe they didn't have time to, to show everybody that was um, at the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. But uh, Mahalia Jackson was one figure that I've uh, read about um, singing at the at the at the March on Washington. And so to see that depiction of her um, through the brilliant acting of Divine, um, who I love. <laughs> 
it's just uh was was really a moment for me that I uh truly enjoyed um and you know we talk about art in the movement um we talk about music in the movement um a lot um mm -hmm. like the importance of that uh both you know in marching in gathering um and in keeping people uh on one beat I guess so to like keeping the rhythm as you're as you're um as you're doing things um and together um but yeah, you know, I was thinking really deeply about like what, how, if things would feel different now, if our celebrities were organized the way that they were then. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't have an answer to that, you know, expect and accept non-closure. Um, but you know, I think a lot of people uh, at that time use their celebrity in really powerful ways. Um, to amplify the movement and so yeah it's just something I'm thinking about come, to come the mic. over Gio's, come to the mic Gio's got a reaction yeah thank, thank you Sierra for opening that part up about celebrityhood the then what we just saw in the movie historically and the I guess uh, up till today right um, I immediately thought about Nina Simone and the artist Duty uh, to reflect the times mm. and I think about how like yeah I think I think a lot about how um, artists you know from various so levels of celebrity right you know because we informally say oh a list b list and all that stuff and then there's even like black cultural breakdowns for like the relevance of celebrities and their effect on our community's perception of politics um it's it's I, f I feel like it's even harder to um to uh break through like that wall almost like there's like a there's like an unseen wall that's created socially and politically that a lot of times our own celebrities from our own communities um are standing guard at that wall at least that's what it seems like to me um you know keeping us from going from one place or another but are we supposed to wait for you know larger scale you know, artists who have that class influence, who have that that larger platform from their celebrity hood, or is it really just up to us to just pull up no matter what? Like, it felt really cool to hear in the film, they said, oh, Harry Belafonte is going to be there. Marlon Brando is going to be there. Stevie Wonder. You know, Stevie, you know what I'm saying? And I'm not saying that we don't have artists that show up to um, large uh, liberation movements. Um, I definitely think that, like, the times have changed and the and the the balance of artists that are for the people versus blatantly against the people some of them tell us in our in their own songs oh you're a broke ass beep if you're a man oh you're a broke ass b if you're a woman and like they tell us in these songs all the time that we're broke we're broke and we're you know we should feel ashamed of that and i feel like we should just listen to what they're saying and just take it for what it is okay you don't stand with us so i'm going to move on from you um, and I think that it almost feels taboo for me to say that. Like, why why do I have to be uncomfortable to say that I don't want to engage with a celebrity if they're literally telling me that they're um, that they are against um, working class people of color, especially working class Black folks in the United States. Uh, so that that's what that's what really resonated with me. Thank you, Gio. I think I want to build on the amazing reflection that Gio just shared and something probably to all of you is, do you feel that if the rest of the movement, that if American citizens, especially Black American citizens, had known what the animosity was towards Rustin, if the animosity from other leaders about his amazing work, do you think that they would have reacted differently? Do you think that they would have engage with these leaders differently if they actually knew what was going on behind the scene with this leader that was literally putting on the march. Okay. I saw I couldn't tell if Mary had their hand up or not. But um actually I have a reaction to both Ooh, good. questions, Kristen here and your reflection Gia. So actually it's interesting you asked that because as we were kind of talking about what was what was um, new for a couple of people. And I also appreciate Susan and Sierra raising up this piece about the, the, the defense of Bayern and a solidarity. I also find myself thinking at the same time that happened and um, I don't know. Um, I, I mean, I, we do know. 
we know um, that buyer continued to experience discrimination, right? So that 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 does appear to be a singular moment that was not necessarily a widespread societal value, right? So it's not like all of a sudden society like pivoted or shifted, right? Um, so for me, I mean, it was interesting looking at that and, and thinking that happened. And it, I almost had the same question and that I don't know that that had an impact in terms of, um, how black communities, um, embrace or did not embrace queerness. Um, we do know that, 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 that definitely was a point in time in which the embrace was lower than what it was previously or post. So also I think another interesting part of history is we did have moments um, in our in our community's history where we did know better <laughs> uh, in that regard and that shifted and we were in, in some very conservative um, moments and you know, a whole lot's happening today, I think, in re in regards to that. It's not, it's not, it's not quite so neat. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's actually, I really appreciate that, that question. So that was, so that was one thing that I found myself um, thinking. And, and so then that makes me, that, that makes me want to answer your question, Kristen, and say, um, I don't know, again, because I think we kind of already know the answer that it, it didn't really. But it also makes me think of kind of, and we talk about this sometimes um, when we think about comms and stuff like that, um, there's push and pull, right? Nothing is one direction. Mm -hmm. You know, so we're we're not, as human beings, we're, we don't just kind of just take in everything and, and, and get influenced by what comes at us. We're also doing our own influencing and pushing out. So I feel like that that's always happening. There's always that push and pull. Um, and I really do love that question because I am so curious about, for example, um, how much influence the big the big six, the big ten, were subject to from people, and what that also looks like in the other direction. Mm -hmm. The celebrity, I love the celebrity question because I love to also raise this fact, which is the other thing, and and Gio raised this, so Gio raised the issue of class. And so I think the other thing we see happening at that time is there was there was less distance between different classes and black communities at that time. Yeah. And so the thing that one, a thing, not the thing, but a thing that's really important to me today that I do wish we just talked about a lot more is the distance between classes and black communities today is the widest it has ever mm -hmm. been. And there was a period of time, particularly during that time, when in our communities and Black communities, distance between classes was the narrowest. So it wasn't just a matter of like, oh my God, Stevie Wonder, oh my God, Harry Belafonte. You'd be walking down the street next to Harry Bel Belafonte if you were Black, because you'd be in the same neighborhood. I mean, Janice, who is here, you can't see her, but last week she told us about meeting Bayard and CCH Pounder was her roommate, and it was just, it was, again, the distance between different classes, and Paula, I see you nodding, so perhaps you can attest to this as well. It was just a lot narrower than it was, than it, than it was today, and today is just why, yeah. so essentially, yeah, so sorry, go ahead. No, no, I was thinking of time, so I could see. I got no, the, you stare. I got the one minute warning, but I just, I, th I think it's just really important that the we 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 have to talk about classism in black communities today. And I think Gio talked about that a little bit. Beautifully. Also gorgeous. And I want to give some on in the last online reflections either on this question or just the series. She can't see I'm, I'm looking literally at Sierra. Paul is clapping. Sierra, yes. <laughs> You're looking at me for a last reflection. I, I mean, can we just have a moment for the strategy of coordination? Um, mm -hmm. because I don't I think watching them, so I have two things in mind. One is watching them call out all of the things that they had gotten done again in eight weeks. I can say Nia, Nia and Mary can say this with me, Genoa, Natasha, Gio. 
I'm an anxious person. I don't know if I could have done that all that name week. <laughs> I would have been like, no, no, no. You need to push it back to September, babe. <laughs> How are we going to get this done? And perhaps it is, you know, having, you know, somebody like Bayard, um, you know, uh, uh, there to, to, I don't know. But uh, I think the fact that they were able to, again, outside of phones, computers, et cetera, pull all of that together um, is just uh, astounding to me. And I think another thing that I learned separately, and I'm going to try to find the um, link slash um, source so I don't misstate this completely. Um, but I think the other thing is that um, they got housing, they got power, they got food for everybody, you know, mm. they had security, they got everybody, mm -hmm. you know, on a bus. You know, there's, there's, there was just so many moving parts. And so I just can't understate the feat that pulling that together was. Um, and the fact that they were able to get all of these different people with all these diff disparate politics um, strategies, ideas of what we should do, what we could do, how we're supposed to do it, you know, supposed to do it, you know, uh, uh, the fact that they got everybody together and on one accord for at least that day cannot be um, undervalued, I think. I think we take it for granted because it happened. <laughs> But watching the movie, I was just like, wow, they things were things were not, you know, it does it's not always a pleasant mm -hmm. team. <laughs> so I, I, I really continuously really think that eventually that someone happened. is going to um like a like some child in like 2060 or something is gonna come to a bunch of us being like, I heard that you were at the fight white supremacy march in Boston and I need to ask you about how that was. <laughs> <laughs> and then we're all gonna have to tell the story. <laughs> Gosh. But I need to check on time. We're good. We're good. Yeah. Okay. Did you want to say something? Okay. Uh, Janice is Janice is Janice is gonna close us out. Come to yeah. the mic, Janice. <laughs> no, you're talking about celebrityhood. Yeah. Yes. But who creates that? Good question. Right. Do you have an answer? You just gonna ask no, that I think, question. No, uh, I the media right. <laughs> um creates it. People who have cameras, people who record stories. Some people are celebrities and no one ever knows who they are. Right. And the other thing I always tell people, people can't do things because they're following certain monies. Mm -hmm. So some people cannot be conscious because they, they, who's giving you the paycheck? You always have to remember that, you know, in sports, entertainment, they have to think about, oh, am I going to keep this house, this car, this whatever, and somebody else gave the money. And the people who are affected by class, didn't create it. You have these outside forces that say, oh, you only make this money, so you're in this group, you're in this group, this group. And that could change wherever you are, whichever city, state, like Massachusetts, poor is like under 49,000. In some places, that wouldn't be it. So we're glad that people do get exposure. It's like, how did they get exposure? And kind of why? So I think we can learn a lot from the march. Mr. Rustin, and um, I'm predicting a new movement is coming because a lot of people are doing things in terms of reparation, the poor people's campaign. So hopefully in Boston, we'll see a strong reemergence to work on some of these things. That's my comment for today. I mean, that's what I'm counting on Sierra for. Thanks to you. Oh, that's Sierra. That's yeah. Sierra. Okay, she's going to do it all. <laughs> Culture part. <laughs> Thank you, Janice. All right. Yeah. Well, I think that you have member teams. I don't think so. Not? not tonight. Do we just get to go on forever and ever and ever? Because, I mean, you, you don't know. I mean, I can talk about movie forever. <laughs> I'm so used to having to end because people are coming into the room being like, I'm ready for my member team at 7.15. <laughs> but I guess this gives us just a teeny bit more time just to hear any last reflections because several of you have been with us for the entire series. So, again, I would love to know what you guys are thinking. Yeah. Uh, I just want to say how much I appreciate the fact that you all showed 
the movie and the three parts and the discussion has been amazing. So thank you so much. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. Like Paula. Oh, okay. Yeah, it looked like Paula was trying to. It looked like Paula, were you gonna unmute or did I did I, I was trying. What I, was I just want to thank y'all. I could say a bunch of things, but right, can you hear me? Yep. Yep. Oops. Okay, thank you all. Yeah, I'm, I'm the, the the conversation is 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 really precious to me. Thank you so much. I'm really excited that I'm glad I caught this at, when I did and look forward to future connections like this. Thank you all. Thank you, Paula. Thank you. Lisa, Lisa put in the chat. Yes, thanks, y'all. This has been lovely and filling. Thank you. And um, oh, just uh, in response to something uh, Sierra said earlier, um, when uh, Sierra said Bayard was a communist, a socialist, Mary in the chat said a communist, not even a socialist. And then Sierra responded to that. I think at that time it was interchangeable our definitions of socialism and communism are different now. Did you want to say something? Come to the mic, Mary. You know how this goes. Come on. Mary, Mary. <laughs> and Mansur said, thanks y'all. I am glad I joined for the discussion. Very enlightening. And Mary's going to weigh in on something. You look, you're, fine. you're fine. You're fine. You. You're fine. I support the empowerment during this Black History yeah. Month. Thank you. Um, that was them curls. Yeah, I... Uh, Sierra, I hear you and I still respectfully disagree in the sense that I think communism still like even then carries a much like deeper and different level of um, dissent. I think like just even political wise to be like, I don't believe in the state um, should be or like just the different ways that I think communists engage with statehood than socialists do was very important. I think it also like reflects in other folks like Angela Davis, mm -hmm. who I think there was a lot more like she's known for being a communist more than the Black Panther Party. Okay. Or like I think that's like one of the differences too. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Mary. All right. Send okay. us away, Kristen. And thank you. Thank you, Kristen. Oh. Kristen, do you want to talk about when you write? Oh, sure. Uh <laughs> Okay, if you ever want to see what I write, I write at a web, mostly I write at a website called Forces of Geek. It really does cover everything that it sounds like it does. Okay. <laughs> um, although um, there will be a review, my review of Rustin, which I did not write for my website, but I am writing for Ujima Project, which will be up by next week. That's what we're going to say for that. Maybe Friday, but definitely by next week. Um, and certainly I would love to see any of you at the Boston Comics and Color Festival because I do sit on the planning committee you want to drop for that a link too. The chat? If I can remember it. <laughs> Boston yeah. Comics of Color. Boston Comics and Color Festival. It is free BIPOC focus comic arts festival that happens at the Reggie Lewis Center. It is I I mean, we can have comedy there too, but this one's more for storytelling, comics, fantasy, the way that we share what we could be and what we have been. And this year we have everyone who is sharing straight fantasy and made up stories and seeing us in all of the areas. But also we have a, a pretty sizable amount of people who are gonna be coming and talking about historical comics and how we use comic arts in order to teach history in more accessible ways, which is why we're we're so thrilled to off, um, have the uh, actual illustrator for the secret history of Black Punk. Amazing. Ooh, yes. It's going to be okay. phenomenal. <laughs> and we have our own special local guest in Joel Gill, who, as some of you might know, just completed a graphic novel version of Eva Rex Candy's Stamp from the Beginning. Mm. Yes. And so he will be there tabling and speaking for free at the Reggie Lewis on April 20th. And yes, I will send this link to the Jira Project to search. And yes, that is 420. Okay. All right. We are very aware <laughs> that it is 420, that it is a legal things holiday <laughs> at the same time. Thank you. And Where else has been a bit of comic festival? And Mary, <laughs> thank you, Mary. I think Mary went and found the link and dropped it. Yes. In the chat. Yes. 
Thank you, Please Mary. Sure so we know how many stickers to buy. All right. And then uh, the website again is Forces of Geek. Forces of Geek. geek. Yeah. Singular Geek. Forces of Geek. Singular geek. Com. Just one geek. Yeah. yeah. All right. <laughs> All right, y'all. Thank you, Sierra. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you, Paula. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Susan Lee.